Now, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Damas, my former math teacher. small town in Oklahoma and everyone knew everyone. We could walk down to the center square and there's a flagpole down there and we'd have our parades. We had a summer festival and everybody knew each other. It was predominantly white and there was a small population of black students in our school. All the black students lived at the creek. When I say they lived at the creek, I meant Every one of the black students of the Creek, I didn't think much about it. It was their neighborhood. It was down by Snake Creek, and um, my mom would go pick them up because in the summer, we, Gil Johnson was one of my friends, and you see my mom in that picture holding his football jersey. She still has it. For 30 years this spring, will be 30 years of my high school graduation, and my mom would wear his jersey every Friday night at the games. Well, in the summer, we'd go down to the community center and we'd dance. Now, some of my students are in the audience, and Jonathan and Nathan know this. I danced, and I was in the Methodist church. We danced in the, in the pool scene ring, all right? That's what we did, all right? So we learned the bus top and the cut and eye joe, and we would dance, and then my mom would take my family from the creek, and we'd go swim. It was the first time, though, I realized there was a difference in physical attributes, because after we would swim, I would notice something on the water. And I said, Mama, what is that? She said, I think it's because of what they put in their hair. So I asked my friends from the Greek, I said, hey, my black friends, hey, what do you put in your hair? And they said, Crisco. Well, I had brown, dark hair, and I had curly hair, and it was a lot, lot curlier back then. And so I went into my pantry, and I got Crisco. And I put it in my hair. Well, you're laughing, and they laughed with me. It was funny. Because it didn't do the same thing. And I realized for the first time there were differences. But the differences went onward because we were best friends. Gil was an amazing running back, um, an amazing one. He got a full ride scholarship to TU, and that's a big deal. From Bixby, which was a small town at the time, to have someone of that caliber playing on our team, he was the king of the court. So it was no surprising that our senior year that he would be the king of the homecoming court. Well, I was the head cheerleader, and we had been best friends all our, our life. But before we were to have the ceremony, I was called in to be told, you will not be, even though you were voted queen, you will not be queen because you, a white girl cannot kiss a black boy. So his cousin Trina, who was also on the court, which was a very good friend of mine, she was queen. Now, I don't tell that story to diminish the, her honor. She deserved it even more than I did. She was an amazing athlete, a great friend of mine. So I don't say that to say that I deserved it more than she did. What I say to you is, is that from that journey, I learned that boundary lines go beyond what you live. Then I went to the University of Oklahoma. I was the director of Singer Scandals. That's the largest student production in this universe, at the university. Most of the time, the people that participated in the Singer Scandals were the white fraternities and sororities. I didn't think much about it. And I know that I say by the saying of a white fraternity and sorority, there's a problem there. But at the time, I didn't think much about it because there was black fraternities and sororities too. Okay. But that year, the top white and black, white and um, sorority and fraternity and the top black sorority and fraternity paired together to do a Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation. It was powerful. They brought the roof down. And of course, they won. But I sat behind the stage and I sat up in the balcony and I realized that I was watching history be made. And I watched friendships formed as they worked together and they sang together. And I realized that friendships, just like when I was a little girl, erased boundary lines. As I graduated from the University of Oklahoma, someone told me that I needed to go see a headhunter. 
I didn't really know much about it. My mortar board at graduation that was in the OU yearbook said you need a job. So I thought, I probably need some pointers, all right? So, because mathematics could go a lot of different ways. And why I'd always wanted to teach, they said, oh, don't just teach. You need to figure out what you can do and make some money. So I went to this head hunter. hunter. I learned a lot of things. She taught me a lot of great tips. I felt like, wow, yeah. But as I was leaving, I said, thank you so much. And I was walking down the stairs. And the person behind me said, the, 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 the person that had worked with me that morning said, don't worry, you won't have any problem getting a job. You're a woman in a minority. I said thank you and I walked on, but I thought to myself, why did they say that? I hadn't filled out an application that said I was a certain race. That had never come up in the conversation. Why would they say that? Now all my life, people had thought I was black. And I would ask, why do you think I'm black? And they said, well, it's because your hair, your skin tone, because in the summer, when I'd lay out, yeah, I was darker than some of my black friends. My voice, I'm loud, my booty. Now, I don't say these things to you. Now, listen, I want to be careful that you understand. I'm not saying this to stereotype, and I'm not saying this to anything. I'm saying this is what was told to me. This is my journey. So, please, I don't mean to draw a fence in it. And I've already told Jonathan, I'm afraid I might be. I'm just telling you my journey. Okay? So that it didn't bother me to be thought of as black. But I already knew that there were some boundary lines that black people had because of my experience as a senior in high school. You don't cross those boundary lines. There were some things that you didn't get to do. But now, as this lady says, I'm not going to have trouble getting a job because I'm a woman in minority. I thought, is there privilege with this too? And to say the least, I was highly perplexed. And part of me didn't even care because I needed a job. So if they were going to give me a job because they thought I was a minority and a woman, I was like, go ahead. I need a job. I don't care how I get it. But in my spirit, I wanted to just get a job because of my merit, not because of what I look like. Well, my first job landed me in Norman. In the first month, we had racial tensions there. This is in 1990. The cowboys, as they were called, and they had boots on, and that's why they were called cowboys, boots on and western belts, were fighting with the black students at lunch. It seemed like every day. There was graffiti on the doors, there were racial slurs said in the halls and outside, and it seemed to be that every day at lunch, down by my room, which was at the end of the hall, there was always a fight. The principal called a meeting and asked for the parents to come in and meet. It was a good meeting, it was a brief meeting, but from that meeting it was decided that the first student organization, black student organization, would be formed in Norman. The principal called the black students in and said, who would you like to run the meetings? They said, Miss Freese. Well, you can tell my surprise when they came to the hall the next day and said, oh, Miss Freese, Miss Freese, will you do it? And I looked at him and I said, I've only been a teacher two months. I don't know what I'm doing. And they said, oh, Miss Freese, we love you. And you're an Oreo. And I said, what's an Oreo? <laughs> and they said, you're a black and white mix. And I said, well, I'm adopted, and that could be. Um, I've always been told I'm Italian, but it doesn't really matter. I don't care if you think I'm an Oreo. I like Oreos. my favorite cookie, and I went on. But what I learned from that was this, is that students need role models. I was the only one on the faculty that had a different pigment color of skin, a darker shade. And they wanted somebody, and they connected with me. And I was blessed that I was asked to do it. So the first Black Heritage Assembly started that fall and that spring in 1991 on Martin Luther King Day. The students planned it, they organized it, they read poetry, they sang songs, they researched key individuals from the black community. It was awesome. And once again, I stood behind the stage or out in the audience and I watched how powerful it is for kids to lead, just like we see today. I also learned to stomp because when I became an administrator in Norman, I started a similar club, and every day at lunch, they taught me to stop, which was a different dance move, and I felt like all the threads from the community center in fourth grade were being pulled together through all my life. Well, Oklahoma University asked me to teach a multicultural class for them one summer, and then I taught that for the next three, se three semesters until God moved us to Bartlesville. It was a very interesting class, and one of the activities was that they had to write, the first activity was they had to write an autobiography of how their past 
had shaped their view of race, ethnicity, ethnicity, and culture. What was fascinating is you could grow up in the same city, same town, even in this relatively one or two miles away and have a vastly different perception of what life was. I remember one student saying to me, I never realized I was poor until I sat in this room, but I slept in a baby bed till I was seven. I didn't think much about it. It was just the way life was. See, that brought me, reminded me that our upbringing reminds us of, or shapes our influence. Ethan, you'll keep moving the slides, so sorry. So that brings us to this spring. I have known the Jocelle family, and I'm a crier, so if I start to cry, for 10 years. It happened because Nathan, the first encounter was Nathan and Noah are in the same class. They were in Miss Dumbleton's class. And Nathan immediately called me his mom. And every day for the last nine years, no matter where I was, if you saw me in the hall, he'd say, how you doing, Mama? And he hugged me. I had Jonathan in my class, too. He was a great student. Well, I called him my son, too. More often than that, I called him Johnny Rockets. Addie knows this. Because of his amazing athletic ability, and just his sunshine personality to be in class with him. Well, there were some things that happened that were hard. And to say hard would be an absolute understatement. I don't say that to cast light, bad light on Christian Heritage Academy. Because the truth is, it happens in our nation. It happens in our city. It happens in our churches. And if we're not willing to talk about it, we're never going to identify with it. And if we're not really willing to even ask ourselves even today, where in my life do I hold prejudice? Where in our life do I see things differently? Or do I cast myself above my brother or sister? We too will only be part of the problem and not part of the solution. I only share this with you to tell you part of the story. I remember it was so hard one night. I was crying so hard that I pulled to the side of the road off I-35 and just wept because I couldn't go home. I was on the phone with Charles Zeta. But of course, here's the problem. When you're a teacher and a preacher's wife, you know everybody. So guess what? Someone pulled behind me with their flashers and asked me if I was okay. And I was like, I'm fine. Don't worry. But I needed help. I needed the Lord's help because it was bigger than me. It was much bigger than me. And I'm thankful that I serve a big God that's bigger than the universe that understands. And if you can reconcile sinful man to a holy God, there is nothing impossible for him. I remember one day this spring, Jonathan and I began a Bible study to which he has continued to read his Bible for over 60 days since this time. I asked him, what do you hope to, that is accomplished through all of this? And he said that they have a better understanding of diversity and that we learn to love each other. And I said to him, Jonathan, is there something bigger than this? And he said, I don't know. I said, Jonathan, if we don't understand how to see people, and see diversity, we are one race. We are covered by the blood of Christ. We are. But if we don't understand diversity and that God has uniquely made us, that's, that's the expression of the Trinity. That's the expression of the Godhead. We'll never reach the nations to Christ, which Revelations 5, 9 explains to us, if we don't see people and embrace the diversity God has given us. It's about the gospel. It's bigger than this. From that time, the Lord directed me in the spring to create, once again, just like back in Norman, a student organization called Each One Reach One. I couldn't get away from it. I'd wake up in the night and the Lord would say, Each One Reach One. I didn't know what it was going to look like. and I didn't know what it was supposed to be. But I knew that the Lord was calling me to, once again, allow students to have a voice to talk through issues. Well, as the summer progressed, God took away some of the students that I thought were going to help work with the club. And it was hard, and I thought the Lord might be doing a new thing. There was one student left that understood the journey that we'd been on that spring. And she came in, and her name was Kira Bridges. And she said, can I talk to you about it? And I said, yes. And she said, what do you want? And I said, I just feel like the Lord wants to do a new song. He wants us to stop the course joking. Does it matter? There was course joking going on. Not horrible, horrible. And the truth is, if you compare it to a lot of schools, we look pristine and we're squeaky clean. But it didn't honor the Lord. And she said, good. Because I don't want to just have a club for diversity's sake. 
I want to have a club that encourages people and promotes unity. So each one reach one began. Its verse is um, Proverbs, I mean John 17, 23, that says, May we be one as the Father in heaven is one. It is commuted, committed to the unity of the student body, but fostering encouragement in the student body. It is trained students in different cultural backgrounds for the purpose of equipping them to reach the nations. It didn't matter to me how many people came. I watched Kira begin to lead, and I watched Kira begin to step out and be a leader, and I thought, Lord, if it never takes off, it's okay. Maybe it was just for a conversation with Kira. We even talked about rolling it into a Bible study that I do called Lantern Ladies. It's a Bible Strip Leadership Program at CHA. I said, but if men come, then we'll make it its own separate standalone. And men came. And this Tuesday was the first time we had the meeting. And there were 30 to 40 students that came. God is at work. And his redemptive plan goes forth. I also am called to train the next generation. We have for a long time taught um, biblical reasoning at CHA. And just like a compass that directs the ascertaining of a course, 5 r is the compass for biblical reasoning. I'd like to share with you today what I feel like as educators we are to train our students in, whether you're an educator at home as a parent, or you're an educator in a school system, or you're in church ministry, or you're a Boy Scout leader, we must teach our, ch our students to reason. We live in a world that does not reason. We reason by our emotion. We'll never win the argument with emotion. You may for a time, but it will not be lasting. We have to learn to think and think critically, which means that we have to understand the standard of truth. So the first star, and I want you to do this, I'm teaching you hand motions in my short little time left, is to get on the same page, and that's the research. You ask questions like, what do you mean? Who would you explain that to me? Would you please clarify what you mean by that? How would you define that? Ethan, keep moving. All right, keep moving. All right, so that you go, if you're going to have a conversation, we have to all be on the same page. We believe in tolerance, but sometimes tolerance is not defined biblically. Right? Have you ever been in a conversation where five minutes into it, you go, oh my goodness, I didn't know you were talking about this. Right? You were saying the same words, but you had no idea where you were. We have to get on the same page and begin to research what they're talking about. When you're in the classroom, let me see that again. When you're in the classroom and you don't understand how to engage with your teacher, you need to ask them, what do you mean by that? The second thing is, is you have to look at, we're going to, have to go fast, I'm so sorry, is you have to understand what lens they're looking from. Everybody has a worldview. We have to stop and reason through that and go, where are they coming from? Where are they getting their information? Because everybody has a source of truth. Now, we know that John 17, 17 says that God's word is truth. So we need to align everything we hear with God's word and ask ourselves if indeed what is being said or proposed is biblical. Then we need to learn to relate to others. That's the third R. We're over here, and someone may be over here, but God's word never changes. It's the centrality of who we are. So we point others to Christ by learning to have a relationship with others to engage in dialogue. Then we have to go to record. Anytime we're faced with truth, it demands a response. We need to learn how to write. We need to learn how to speak. We also need to learn how to be a living record of what God and record with our lives what God has called us to do. And number five is we always need to stop and take time to have a conversation. Because people are asking these questions. People are wanting to know. People are wanting to discuss these things. And if we don't talk to them and just point them the truth, someone else will. So we need to learn to stop and take the conversation with them. And relate to them. And pull back the word of God, which is unchanging and infallible and inherent. And point them to Christ. Because this is bigger than diversity. This is the gospel at stake. And it's the nations that God demands. Amen.